This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Struck Human rights China issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. Of the Alien and Sedition Act. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. Not only a matter of exemplary scholarship, but a model scholar who, by virtue of instincts and intuition, much trial and error, uh, through resolve and resilience, and most of all, by passion of purpose, has contributed to setting in place the basis upon which scholars of the next generation who work on Cuba will engage one another and engage the subject of their research. So it is indeed my pleasure to introduce to you Rebecca Scott for this afternoon's keynote address. I'm on. Yeah. Oh, well, <clears throat> Lou, that is the most generous introduction I've ever received, so I thank you very much. And how did you know that I spent all morning on email with the immigration authorities in Cuba? Because we're now going to do the second of the seminars called Getting the Documents to Speak. We will have faculty. It will take place in Havana in about eight days from now. It will have faculty from six countries, including Senegal this time, students from six countries. And uh, I wish I thought we had all the visas lined up. Mine, I FedExed the incorrect one that they sent me. I got FedExed out from Chapel Hill yesterday. If I get the good one by Monday, I'll be off to Cuba again. So it, it's, um, it is certainly an, an art and mystery working on Cuba. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's great to be back at Duke UNC and in North Carolina more generally. Um, I won't do that sort of thing about my ties in North Carolina. About half people in the room already know that. I went uh, to Chapel Hill High School and uh, did MAT studies at Duke, and it's uh, lovely to be back. Um, the last time that I was in North Carolina and spoke at UNC, I talked about the Atlantic itinerary of one family. Some of you may have been, oh, Bonnie is nodding, some of you were in the audience then. And I looked at five generations of a single family from the enslavement of a woman named Rosalie in Senegambia, her deportation to Saint-Domingue uh, as a slave, her liberation during the Haitian Revolution, her flight from warfare in the area around Jérémy and Les Abricots, uh, she fled to Santiago, Cuba, and I then follow her return to Haiti, her daughter's move to New Orleans, her daughter's marriage, the birth of six children, the uh, diaspora then of that family to France, to Belgium, and then many of them back to New Orleans, where two of them enlisted in the Union Army during the Civil War, uh, and one of them served as a member of the Constitutional Convention of 1867-68 for the state of Louisiana, helping to write the most radical state constitution, I think, ever written in the 19th century. So that story, and I said to Laurent, I won't tell that story today because Laurent has heard it now three times. So I'm going to tell a different set of stories today. But that story, uh, co-authored with my colleague Jean-Michel Hébrard, has now become a book manuscript. So um, by the next time I come back to speak, I hope I'll have that book in my hand. So what I'll do instead today is something uh, quite different, which is instead of giving you uh, the kind of results and analysis that emerged from, from that particular historical inquiry, which we think of as a kind of micro-history set in motion. Instead, I'm going to uh, open up with, the, I'm going to focus on the kinds of fragments of evidence that one has when one begins a project, rather than the interconnected webs of evidence that one hopes to have at the end. Lou will recognize this phenomenon. He and I have often consulted when we have just seen one or two documents. Remember when you started working on rice? Lou saw me when he said, he said I'm going to work on rice. And I thought, what are you going to do about rice? <laughs> you know? And the answer was, it's the key to US. Turns out it's the key to US-Cuban relations in a certain moment in the 1950s. So this is, but it began presumably as a fragment, an archive in Lafayette, Louisiana. Am I right? Archive in Lafayette, Louisiana, in your case. So, so back to the stage of fragments. But fragments that are being gathered with a particular purpose, which is to address a specific analytic question. Um, and here's how the, this is the question. It's a big one. I think it's a straightforward one. We're all, and it has to do with historiography and history and analysis of slavery. We are all accustomed to thinking of slavery as a legal system. 
indeed, because it is. Uh, and indeed, we are often told that one of the features of slavery in the 19th century is that although we, of course, now regard it as a morally reprehensible institution, it was at the time perfectly legal. You've probably heard this many times. This is a statement uttered across the political spectrum. It's uttered by opponents of reparations who are quick to assure us that it was perfectly legal, so no guilt can uh, attach to those who engaged in it. It's, uh, it's offered by people on a more uh, different end of the spectrum in emphasizing the absolute complicity that comes from slavery having been embedded within the laws of the United States. But it may be that that uh, assurance although it's not strictly incorrect, actually deflects attention unintentionally from the mode by which a legally recognizable property interest in a human being was actually established case by case, if you follow me. In other words, if we look at it top down, we take the numbers of slaves in a particular county or state at a particular date, or we look at a census, or we read an inventory, we're looking at slavery as a legal system. But what about the process by which any property claim in a person came into being? Uh, that process, I think, could take place quite outside the law. And that then helps us to ask the question whether our definition of slavery as uh, the, proper, the holding of property, the legal holding of property in men and women, whether that's actually an adequate understanding of what's going on. There's a second issue which I won't address today, but which comes from the fact that when we emphasize the legal and legalized nature of 19th century slavery, we tend to open up the gap between 19th century slavery and contemporary slavery, that which exists in the 21st century, because it seems as though we must be talking about two quite different things, since almost by definition, slavery in the 21st century is outside the law. But when we focus on the process by which those claims were made over the bodies and souls of other human beings, then to some extent, the gap closes. So I won't talk today about contemporary slavery, but Part of the reason why I'm exploring this question actually has to do with parallel work that I'm doing with colleagues in international law on uh, defining and adjudicating cases of contemporary slavery. But for, from the historian's point of view, for the historical materials, uh, there's one very dramatic set of events in Atlantic history that I think open up the possibility for us to try to explore the relationship of law, force, and circumstance in the process of enslavement. And that, of course, is the Haitian Revolution. Now, my point of departure will not be the entire Haitian Revolution itself. I wouldn't dare do that with Laurent setting, sitting in the second row. Um, instead, I'll start toward the end. Um, my point of departure will be the summer of 1803, as thousands of refugees crossed the Windward Passage from the war zones of Saint-Domingue, war because of the arrival of the Napoleonic uh, expedition under, under General de Klerk, attempting to wrest power away from uh, Toussaint Louverture and his allies. Um, so what I will look at is the way in which people fled the war zone to particularly Santiago and Baracoa. And those of you who were in the talk last year will recall that that is a path that Rosalie of uh, the Poulard Nation followed. That's how I first began looking carefully at this uh, emigration. But when I was sitting in the archives in Havana reading the reports day by day that were being written by the governor of Santiago, I was very struck by one uh, letter that he wrote in which he communicated with his superiors to say, what am I supposed to do, he said, about some of the people who are arriving, gente de color no reconociendo la esclavitud, people of color who are arriving here seeking asylum and who do not recognize slavery. Well, the, the phrase kind of took my breath away because we don't, as a rule, imagine that slavery requires that its victims recognize the institution. Uh, 
it's not a treaty, it's not a contract, although we know that it can contain negotiation of various kinds, we rarely envision that there could be the option of a refusal of a recognition that one is in a state called slavery. So what was the governor thinking? And what might we take the phrase to mean above and beyond whatever he thought it meant? So, 1803, this audience uh, doesn't need much of a review of the circumstances that triggered the departure of refugees from Jérémy and other ports uh, on the coast of Saint-Domingue. But it may be worth just recalling that this was a very particular wave of immigration. It was an enormous wave of immigration, probably 18,000 people. But it was not the one that is most classically uh, evoked, which is the, em the exodus of planters and others in 1793 as the city of Le Cap was being burned. And it was not final departures after the end of the war. These were refugees, citizens of the French colony of Saint-Domingue, and I'll emphasize in a moment why we should envision them all as citizens, black and white. They had all seen the abolition of slavery in 1793. They had seen its ratification by the French National Assembly in 1794. They had seen it be made extensive to the entire colony once the British withdrew their forces in 1798. So it's worth recalling that all of these individuals in this exodus from the Haitian Revolution were people who had remained after the abolition of slavery. Just about every one of those individuals had lived for at least five years, and in many cases 10, clear in the knowledge that there was no longer any slavery recognized by law in Saint-Domingue. Now, why am I hammering on this? Everybody knows that the Haitian Revolution abolished slavery. I'm emphasizing it because I'm emphasizing what each of those people knew about their own status and the status of others at the moment that they climbed aboard boats. Now, it's certainly true that the colony's adaptation to a regime of free labor had been, and here the phrase I wrote in my draft is, uneven in many respects. But that sort of sounds like Robert Gibbs talking about the path toward democracy in Egypt. It's been uneven. Um, to, say that it, to say that it was uneven is an understatement. Uh, many of you know that many people who had been held in slavery remained attached in one way or another to land or to the households in which they had once served as slaves. Um, but they also knew that they were legally free. Now, the situation was made more complex by the fact that the invasion force sent by Napoleon that had landed in 1802 certainly intended to reestablish slavery if possible. That was clear from what they were doing elsewhere in the Caribbean. But Napoleon's forces had, Leclerc's forces, had not succeeded in doing so. They had wreaked havoc. And the effort to repel them was continuing to wreak havoc. That's why there were 18,000 refugees. But the residents of the colony continued to hold the legal status of free persons. OK, I have hammered that point home. So now, these people are fleeing in boats, small and large. These boats, small and large, are headed for the shore of Cuba. Now. Cuba is a Spanish colony at this moment. Spain is an ally of France. So the island of Cuba is a logical place to seek asylum. There is reason to believe that the asylum will be granted. But a very large question, generally implicit but very large, quickly arose. As these refugees set foot on the shore of the slaveholding island of Cuba, what was the status of those who had been freed by the action of a revolution that had so deeply alarmed the authorities in the neighboring colonies, including Cuba. Now, if we try, it's very hard to envision what people were thinking, because the whole process has been re-described in such a way as to make it look as if there was no uncertainty. If you go look at Lou, maybe you can correct me, but I've never seen a document written in Cuban history that ever described the subset of those refugees who came to be enslaved as otherwise, other than just slaves. You always read that refugees from Saint-Domingue arrived with their slaves. But it had been a long time since any of these people had been denominated esclave, slaves, in the official documents of Saint-Domingue. The ones who worked in the countryside were usually now called cultivateurs. Those who worked in households or in town were sometimes called domestiques, 
which echoed the old phrase of esclave domestique, but it was also a term that in French could refer simply to free laborers. Uh, in France, the term was used all the time for rural workers. Now, General Leclerc had begun to introduce again the word, the, the, the verb affranchir, to manumit, because as he tried to recruit black soldiers to join him in the invading army, not, not something which he was notably successful, but as he tried to do it, he offered to affranchir in return for service, which of course raised the extremely alarming implication that those who did not join him would be deemed to be back in the state of slavery. But as a practical matter, Leclerc had not been in a position to reimpose bondage on a colony he could not control. So if we look at the passenger lists on those boats, we notice a couple of things. We notice great ambiguity in the terms that are attached to them, sometimes the word domestique, occasionally the word esclave, sometimes the word negre, Sometimes the word, sometimes they're sometimes been drawn up in Spanish, mulatas libres, all kinds of things. We notice that people seem to have boarded the boats often in loosely constituted household groups, or they formed themselves into such groups once they were aboard. I think these groups probably reflect some of the complicated relationships of dependence and reciprocity that had developed in the countryside in the previous decade. Others who arrived on those boats were people who had once been enslaved, but who had kept significant, who had placed significant distance between themselves and anyone who had ever had a claim over them. And I think those are the people who are most conspicuous in the governor's uh, envisioning of people who arrive no reconociendo la esclavitud. So as the boats dropped anchor at the mouth of the harbor in Santiago, the commandant at the fort sought guidance from the governor, Sebastián Quindelán. And Quindelán initially just had a straight up uh, racial reflex. And the very first documents uh, that, were, that were generated by this, which are in the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, um, he simply said that the negros and mulatos can't get off the boat, and the whites can. So, but it wasn't long before, that, that was a policy that he could sort of declare in the first couple of days when there were two or three boats in the harbor. But it very quickly became clear that there were lots more boats coming. There are going to be soon hundreds and thousands of people. The captains of those boats generally wanted to disembark everybody quickly and go back and get another load. They were charging money for these passages. They wanted to disembark everyone. And one way or another, it became clear that people could not simply be left on boats in the harbor ad infinitum. People were going to need to, draw, to, to set foot on dry land. So the governor tried to come up with a policy in which he said, well, I will allow loyal domestics to be landed with their masters. Now, historians have tended to rule, read this then as just the slaves. But I will allow criados, he said, to come in with their masters. But those whom he viewed as dangerous, and this was all males, a negro or mulatto, over the age of 13. That is to say, if you had seen what had happened in Haiti and you were male, you were a priori dangerous from his point of view. Uh, they were to be placed on a hulk in the harbor. And a man named Joseph Marti, who was a Catalan, not Jose, but Joseph, who was a Catalan slave trader, um, it conveniently made available a large boat to put them on. At least 150 people were put on that boat initially. Now, uh, I won't go into much detail about Santiago at this moment, but as most of you know, this is the period of, the, of, the, of a surge in imports of Africans as captives. Uh, many thousands were being landed on the shore in Santiago. This was unequivocally a slaveholding society. And so those from those among the white refugees from Saint-Domingue and some who were categorized immediately as free people of color, those who had financial resources and a kind of habit of command, I think, were often able to make a fairly convincing case by their behavior that if they were allowed to maintain control over others, 
who had been characterized as domestique or criados. They had something, they first of all had something to offer the agricultural economy of Cuba, and second of all, they would thus have a means for their own support and be less likely to be dependent on the government uh, for assistance. Um, sometimes they make the, ca the case, very, case very simply. I, they would say, I have nothing for my support but the one or two loyal slaves who came with me. Of course, you will allow me to keep them. So, in other words, relations of force and dependence and presumptions about color and ethnicity were working to attach to people what would thereafter become an enforceable legal status as property. But note that there is no legal process that is actually doing the attaching. Now, when this first began to become clear to me as I was reading through the documents, I thought, I thought I'd made an extraordinary discovery. I thought I had found out that slavery in these cases, and this is a lot of people, this is more than 3,000 people, and many of them, as I'm going to say in a few minutes, are going to end up in the United States, that it was at its core not legal in many, many instances, in these thousands of instances. And so I recklessly gave a talk to the faculty at the law school. And I was actually interrupted in the middle of the talk. I hadn't even finished when a specialist in property sitting in the front row said, wait a second. <laughs> and I turned and he said, you're acting as though that's something particular to slavery, he said. But law doesn't create property. He said, law just recognizes property, all property. So I was sort of taken aback. It hadn't really occurred to me that these colleagues of mine in suits and ties believe that all property is theft and that law just comes along afterwards and makes it look legal. So, so <laughs> that kind of took me aback. So I, I tried to keep going with my discovery that the ownership of property in human beings uh, had been anchored in force rather than in law. Um, and I faltered. Uh, but then I went back and thought, OK, what am I trying to say? If I've said something that seems crashingly obvious to property specialists, but that seems utterly surprising to me, there must be something still to figure out here. Because I realized, upon reflection, that of course what was at stake here was not just who held property in a particular piece of property, but whether human beings were liable to be held in, as property at all. That was the point for people who had come from Saint-Domingue, where that question had been answered emphatically a decade earlier, no, there could be no property in human beings. So in effect, and here's how I began rethinking it. It was as if, not even just as if, it is that. The change in jurisdictions had brought about a situation in which a brand new property right could be created and then recognized by law by sort of reaching for an assumed propertiness that was somehow construed as still residing in persons who had believed themselves permanently free. I even spent an hour with that same property law specialist trying to convince him of this. And he finally conceded that, well, Yes, it looked as though what had happened is that those individuals had gained occupancy of themselves when they were freed, but not possession, <laughs> right? So there was still a propertiness to be pulled back out. So recall the governor's worried letter. What am I to do with these people of color who do not recognize slavery? So we get a glimpse here of the way in which the governor recognized, in effect, that there had been a breach there had been a breach by the crossing of, that, of, the, of the Windward Passage, and there had been a breach in consciousness. Now, eventually, the authorities in Spain said, um, tell you what, why don't you deport them all to Tierra Firme, to the coast, to the Caribbean uh, mainland of the Spanish Americas, and have them supported there at the expense of the Royal Treasury until we can figure out what to do about them. Um, and then he said, meanwhile, why don't you investigate the true status of each of them? So it's interesting that there's still this notion that there's a true status that could be determined. And I think there's good reason why that true status was not going to be acknowledged based on people's assurance that slavery had been abolished in the place from which they came. It would be dangerous indeed for them to even say as much. Now, what I wish I could report to you was that through assiduous research, I had located records on the arrival of each of these individuals on the coast of Tierra Firme. 
at the seminar that's coming up in Havana, we're going to try very hard to find evidence of that. But I actually think that the, the deportations were not carried out full scale. There's no evidence of large numbers of boats leaving, and my colleagues who work on Venezuela and Colombia say that they have seen no evidence of large numbers of boats arriving, and they would be large numbers. So we have to make some inferences then about the fate of various people of color whose deportation the Spanish authorities had envisioned as imminent, but who in fact I think often did not leave en masse, although I think some of them left on their own initiative for various reasons. Um, and I think some of them were almost certainly sold into the slave markets. Joseph Marti owned that boat. They were on that boat. I'm sure he was experienced at slipping people into the market as captives. So what I'm going to do to, with the last uh, 10 minutes or so is to give you a glimpse of some of these. They're not precisely the same individuals, but they're people flowing out in this wave of 1803 migration and in, in, uh, in one case definitely coming through Cuba. Some of these individuals who were in effect sort of ricocheted into a world of itinerant witnesses and veterans of the Haitian Revolution whose very presence the defenders of slavery considered altogether unwelcome. And many of you will hear an echo here of Julius Scott's uh, famous uh, dissertation done at Duke, The Common Wind, about the movement uh, in the world of, of the Atlantic of uh, African Americans influenced by, in various ways, the Haitian Revolution. So I'll just introduce you to two people. I won't be telling you complete life histories. These are, these are people whom I've just found in the archives fairly recently. And then I'll wrap up so we can open up for discussion. The first is, uh, I, I only found this document last week, so this is brand, this is completely fragmentary, but his name is well, his, we don't know what his name is. His name may have been Jack Zachary. First time we see him, it's, it's probably Jacques Zachary, right? But the first announcement calling for anyone who finds him to put him in jail and return him to Joseph Tinchon calls him Jack Zachary. But the same announcement says, but he's now calling himself John Harrison. So we find an ad in a Baltimore newspaper offering $10 reward for anyone who would jail and bring to him, quote, my Negro fellow named Jack Zachary, but now going by the name of John Harrison. He is a Negro who has been some time in Hispaniola, which is the very oblique way, I think, of referring to, to uh, San Domingue, Santo Domingo, almost certainly, given what I know about the man who's putting the ad in the paper, almost certainly San Domingue. He is a Negro who has been some time in Hispaniola and who has for several years, this is the ad, been employed, for several years been employed as a cook on board of vessels from this port. He has just arrived from La Guira in the schooner Harmony, Captain Samuel Gould. Now, so at this point it becomes almost completely speculative, right? That's all we've, right now, that's that's all we got is that ad. But what can we figure out? Well, I went and looked in the shipping news. And here I should tell you that Historic American Newspapers has just updated uh, and has put scanned, digitized images, word searchable, from the commercial advertiser papers of 1803, 1804, which means you can go right in and look for the schooner Harmony, and you'll find that schooner each time she comes to port. And you'll find her when she comes to port um, with, uh, with Captain Samuel Gould. So, so, you, so we find her coming into port in the shipping news. She's carrying a cargo of cacao. She's supposed to be from a place called La Guira. Well, you know, you look for La Guira, you look for, you won't find La Guira. There's, there's no La Guira. So then what do you do? Well, the great thing about having been teaching for 30 years is you send an email to one of your students who was out in the field, and you say, Edgardo, tell me, what do you suppose this is? And Edgardo writes back from the archives in Bogota and says, Claro, right? It's La Guaira. It's the major port of Caracas, the major cacao port. And from then on, you act as if, if you're me, you always knew that, of course, La Guaira was the major port of Caracas. And that's where all the cacao was coming from. So we begin to see some of the ricochet of Jack Zachary. But remember, Tanchon is saying he's been working for several years as a cook. Now, what do we know? We know that. Tanchon, that is the man who's putting the ad in, and Laurent will be the person who'll be wondering how can this be a Tanchon. This is the long lost French great grandfather, turns out. Okay, so, so we know that Tanchon was a French colonist and that he lived in 
le cap, au cap. And we know that he left Saint-Domingue for Baltimore, and we are pretty sure that he went back, because we find him getting a building permit in 1799 to rebuild his house in Le Cap. So he's one of the many people who came back because of the appeal to come back and reclaim their landed property. So we begin to wonder, in what sense is Jacques Zachary, Jack Zachary, John Harrison, in what sense is he the slave of Joseph Tinchon? I was telling the story to my husband last night, and my husband said, maybe Joseph Tanchon is just figuring it's worth $10 to see if he can get somebody to grab him. And then maybe Maryland law will let him hold on to him. I don't think he ever succeeded in grabbing Jack Zachary. Uh, a couple weeks later, we find another ad for Jack Zachary, slightly different wording, signed by somebody else. I think Joseph Tanchon took a stab at it, gave up, sold whatever rights he had to somebody else, who then went and tried to chase down this cook sailor. So I think we're probably looking at someone who, uh, whom Joseph Tanchon described as, quote, my Negro fellow. But I think Jack Zachary saw, thought of himself as his own man. Now, Jack Zachary is, at this point, just a silhouette on the horizon. He's going to require lots of new research in order to be able to draw him in three dimensions. But his actions, I think, suggest this large gap between a claim of a legal property right in the form of a claim to mastery uh, over a slave, implied by that ad, which looks like all of the other ads for runaways, and any practical exercise of a property right. So to get a clearer sense of the shifting boundary between enslavement and freedom, though, we need also to look at something that operates in the reverse. If Jack Zachary was a man probably living very much as free, over whom someone asserted a legal claim of ownership, but could, which they could not impose, we might look at someone whose circumstances are a bit different. And here I'll talk for just a minute about Adelaide Metaillé. And um, I, I know much more about her, and I won't keep you long enough to hear everything I know about her, but you're welcome to ask more questions. But I'll give you uh, just a quick itinerary. She was born to an enslaved mother before the Haitian Revolution in 1782 in Le Cap, in Cap Francais. During the first years of the Haitian Revolution, after Cap Francais was burned, the man who had owned her, who owned her mother, or who had owned her mother and his wife, uh, fled to New York, and they took the young Adelaide with them as a slave, more or less. They then, too, like Joseph Tanchon, came back in 1799 when Toussaint invited people to return. And they brought Adelaide back with them. Now, here's where we begin to see the shift in status. By the time they return to Le Cap, there is no more any slavery in Le Cap. There's a fairly draconian set of work regulations. And so if Charles Metaillet and his wife were able to argue convincingly that they were elderly people depending on the service of Adelaide for their survival. The labor code actually did oblige Adelaide to continue working for them. So she probably initially believed herself to be in some kind of a bound relationship with them, although it wouldn't have taken long uh, out talking to people in the streets of Le Cap for her to realize that slavery as such uh, was no more. So what she did, she had a child by this point, and what she did was she was able to earn enough money to offer a deal to Charles Metaillé. She offered him money in return for a receipt. She gave him 360 gourdes, and he gave her a receipt that released her from any labor obligation. There couldn't be a manumission, obviously, under law at this point, because there was no slavery. So instead, this is a private receipt. He says, I give her the present sale in order that it may serve to assert her rights without any reservation. But there was one catch, which is he did not add her son's name to the receipt. He apparently told her that he wanted to keep the boy with him a little longer, and he would free the boy graciously on his own initiative a little later. Now, she worked as a marchand, and then in the 
tumult of the uh, Napoleonic invasion. She was able to recuperate her little boy, but she, like many other people, fled the war zone. She went first to Kingston, Jamaica, and then she went on to Cuba and settled in the town of Baracoa. Now, in Baracoa, she behaved exactly like the free woman she knew herself to be. She had a new partner. Oh, we think it's a new partner. It may have been the same one. They had two children. She baptized each of those little girls as free children. Each time the priest would say, oh, can you show me your freedom papers? And each time the baby's father would say, oh, you know, we forgot them and left them at home. And the priest would say, you know, next time you really better remember to bring them. And he, yes, we know this from testimony later on. So, so she had that receipt. She probably knew that it was a little fragile. But now she was able to build on it because now each of the girls had a baptismal document that would declare them to be born free. Um, we know more about it. We know, that, we know that she was very adamant about her free status. Once she got into a quarrel with one of her neighbors, and in the midst of the quarrel, the neighbor referred to her as a slave. She grabbed the neighbor. They marched off to the governor of Baracoa. She got the governor of Baracoa to read her receipt to tell everybody publicly that she was a free woman and to send the uh, irascible neighbor home, promising never to refer to her as a slave again. Um, and we also know testimony from one of her neighbors who said, for those of you who, who read French, I like this phrase, Adelaide a toujours joui de sa liberté à Baracoa. Elle y était fort à son aise. She was always free. She always enjoyed her freedom in Baracoa. She was very much at ease there. So she seemed to be happy in Baracoa, or she seemed to be well settled in Baracoa. But then in 1808-1809, as you know, Napoleon invaded Spain. That caused Spain and France to be in conflict. That caused the Spanish governor of Cuba to expel anyone perceived as a French citizen. Now, the next phase of the story, which I will go over, which I will only give you very briefly because it's, it's New Orleans, but she, along with 10,000 re-refugees, in effect, got on a boat and landed in New Orleans. Now, in New Orleans, she continued to live as a free woman of color. She had three children, whom, for the moment, everyone treated as free. The question of the status of those same re-refugees when they landed in New Orleans was, if anything, even more complicated than it had been in Santiago. The United States had out, the United States Congress had outlawed the foreign slave trade. No one could bring anyone into the territory or states of the United States for the purpose of holding or selling them as a slave. But through some pretty complicated sleights of hand, 3,000 of those re-refugees were enslaved, many of them right on the wharf, getting off the boat in New Orleans. That's a, that's a whole complicated question in New Orleans history that I will leave aside for the moment. But Adelaide dodged that one. And she came in in the category free woman of color. Well, and then for the next year, there, were all kind, there was all kinds of back and forth about what the precise status was of the re-refugees. But in, uh, in March, I think it was, of, 18, yes, of 1810, the Legislative Council and uh, the governor of the territory of New Orleans, of Orleans, issued a statement saying that all of those who had been brought in as slaves with the refugees could now be bought and sold as property. That very same day, a man named Louis Noré decided to go to the local court. Now, Louis Noré, and if this were, if this were a storytelling thing, I'd say, the tailor Noré. He's, he's definitely the heavy in this story. He had crossed paths with Adelaide. He knew her. He'd been a business partner of the man who had formerly been her owner. And they seem to have had perfectly cordial relations in New Orleans for that first year. Indeed, she had such confidence in him that she gave him the uh, receipt for safe. Yeah, exactly. Dun, da, dun, da. She gave him the receipt for safekeeping. Now, she probably thought that was a good idea, because if her status was ever challenged, One's best bet was to have white people go to a notary saying, I knew her, I knew she was free, here's her freedom paper. So she was probably doing something that made strategic sense. But she, she had confidence in the wrong guy. The day that the governor said that all transactions would now be normal transactions of property uh, held in these slaves, Nohe went to the local parish court. He made the following argument. He said, 
Um, I was the business partner of Charles Metayer, and Charles Metayer's brother, Louis, owed me money that he still owes me. Um, Charles Metayer, he said, I think is now dead. Louis is his heir. Louis owes me money, but Louis is in Guadeloupe, so I can't collect from Louis. So I would like a court order giving me the right to seize any property belonging to Charles Metayer that exists in the city of New Orleans. And the judge said, sure. Gave him the order. The sheriff went and seized Adelaide and the three children, put them in jail, and advertised them for sale in the Moniteur de la Louisiane. Now, uh, at the last minute, I, when I went and found the newspaper, I watched this ad coming out. It would say, you know, in four weeks, this sale will take place. Three weeks, two weeks, one week. Just before the scheduled sale, Adelaide Metayer managed to find a lawyer who came in and filed suit in the appropriate form for a freedom suit. That is to say, he charged the sheriff with assault and battery, claiming that this was false imprisonment. And the court sort of hesitated for a minute, then concluded that they would have to adjudicate her status. But when the lawyer proffered a copy of that receipt, it's caused, this, was, this had two problems. One, Noray's lawyer then said, it's a forgery. Well, he knew it was a forgery. I didn't know it was a forgery because he'd stolen the original. So he said, it's a forgery. And she said, it's an exact copy of the one that he stole. So they read it. And they noticed that her oldest boy's name was not on the freedom document. She tried to convince them that he was only nine years old, that he'd been born after she'd been free. But somebody said, no, he's 11. He was already born when she was freed. So he was sold at auction the next morning while the case went forward about her status. Now, as it turned out, given the slave market in New Orleans, that auction yielded a sum of money larger than the total debt that the Taylor Noré had claimed to be owed. So the case stopped and was discontinued without any adjudication about her status. Now, I said I was going to wrap it up quickly. You sort of do want to know what happened, don't you? So, OK. So she went home. She had lost her oldest boy. She still had her two other girls. And she seems to have lived in relative peace for the next five years. She had another baby. I just found that sacramental record last week in New Orleans. She stopped using the surname Metayer. She st this I just learned. She stopped using that surname that associated her with this whole tangle of people in Lecap. She presumably never wanted to see any more of them again as long as she lived. So she began calling herself Adelaide Durand. I think she took the name of the father of her children. But in 1816, the Taylor Noré ingeniously tracked down the son of Charles, the former owner, and got a power of attorney to try and go make claim over Adelaide and her children, claiming an uninterrupted chain of property ownership going back to his father, Charles. In other words, effacing entirely everything that had happened in Saint-Domingue, Cuba, and everywhere else, and trying to get the whole family. This probably, from Pierre Metayer's point of view, he was up in New York. Somebody says to him, hey, give me a power of attorney, and I can go get you the value of four slaves. And she's had a new babe, four slaves on the New Orleans market. Now, at this point, it may be worth noticing a couple of things. I mean, we've, we've talked about the way in which there seemed to be a, a sort of reaching for a latent propertiness. But notice one thing. The boy who was sold at auction, the oldest child whose name I've never been able to find, that property relationship has been created completely out of whole cloth in New Orleans. That is to say, he was born after the abolition of slavery in Saint-Domingue. He was never a slave of Charles Metayer. He was never a slave of anybody. The law simply creates his condition as slave through this sleight of hand in the courts. Now, as I've said before, the, 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 the change in jurisdiction had created a kind of rupture in legality. But, and here's where the interesting legal twist comes in. in when Noray comes back, there, there are in the end seven lawsuits, attempts to re-enslave Adelaide Metayer initiated by Louis Noray. So I will not march you through them all. I've got a, a, a law review article that marches through all of them. I'll be happy to give you the, the web link to it. Um, but, What's interesting is that toward the end, 
an ordinary jury in New Orleans began to incline toward Adelaide. I think that given the existence of the category free, uh, this is a speculation, of the category free women of color, given that Adelaide had lived and breathed and credibly performed that role throughout six years of being, or six or seven years of being in New Orleans, I think it began to be the case that juries swung against Nore. They may also have smelled some personal vindictiveness in all of this above and beyond legal claims of property. So we get a first jury that rules in her favor. Nore appeals it. It goes all the way to the Louisiana Supreme Court. Louisiana Supreme Court overturns the jury ruling and judges that she is a slave. But Nore doesn't seem to have actually been able to lay his hands on her in this instance. And so then Pierre Metaillet, the son of the former owner, files what is going to be the last lawsuit. And it's, it, it has a marvelous plaintive petition. He says, she refuses to give up herself as a slave to your petitioner. In other words, make her behave in the status that I believe her to occupy. And this time, it again goes through the whole process. It gets up to the Supreme Court. And this time, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court makes the most intriguing legal argument. He says, well, hmm. we're in Louisiana under US federal law, Louisiana state law. The digest of the laws in force in New Orleans in 1808, which is the digest of prior French and Spanish law uh, created. But he said, anything that is not specifically countervened by those and that comes from Spanish law is still effective. And in the Siete Partidas of Alfonso the Wise, there is a clause called prescripción, which says that if a slave has lived as free, as a free person, for 10 years in the same country as the master, or 20 years in another country, that slave shall henceforth be considered to be free. It's a standard property concept. It's like statute of limitations or, or adverse possession. But it doesn't exist in Louisiana law, but it exists in the Siete Partidas. So Chief Justice Durbigny then acknowledged that slavery had been abolished under the civil commissioners in 1793-94 in Saint-Domingue. He doesn't give legal effect to that abolition. If he were to do that, he would upset the apple cart. There were 3,000 people in New Orleans who had been, lived through that in Saint-Domingue and who were back in slavery. So he doesn't give legal effect to the abolition, but he starts counting the years from which Adelaide had lived as free from that date. And since we are now finally in 1817, when he counts it up, it reaches the magic number of 20, and he, uh, he adjudicates her as free. Now, it was, of course, nine years too late for her oldest boy, who was, as far as I can tell, completely gone. They, I would imagine, my guess, again speculative, is that after being sold, he was probably sold into the countryside to get him away from the woman who would believe him to be free. But it gives you a sense, I'll, I'll wrap up right here, it just gives you a sense, I think, of this, um, of the tugging and hauling. The, the story ends on an up note, because Adelaide succeeds. But what I hope it does also, is to emphasize the way in which that latent propertyness could be reached for without there being any legal basis for a property right. And I hope that when we, when we teach or write those familiar uh, statements about refugees arriving, 3,000 of them white, 3,000 of them free people of color, 3,000 of them slaves, I hope we'll stop. And I hope we'll introduce some kind of awkward phrase uh, that will indicate that people may be held as slaves rather than our naturalizing the term. Because after all, was Adelaide Metayer's eldest son a slave? Was she herself a slave? The point's not really to re-argue it before an imaginary court. It's rather to realize that the little boy was sold as a slave. And at the end of the day, Adelaide was not. And that we might do well to let these awkward phrases, held as a slave, sold as a slave, lived as free, sink in before we return to our familiar shorthand of simple nouns and adjectives, slave, free, freed. Thank you.
and I'll be happy to take questions or comments or observations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That seems to lay the precedent for this complicated law that was in Louisiana. Do you think that's possible? Well, you know, I have a colleague who works on in, in German law, and he called that same rule to my attention. I think this one has a somewhat different path. I think this one comes through from a uh, from a sort of straight up Rome, modification of Roman law concept of prescription, because first of all, it isn't a year and a day. Um, it's a whole lot longer. 10 years or 20 years sets a very, very high threshold. And second of all, it's modeled right on the concept of prescription that applies to other property as well. Very short period of time for personal property, much longer period of time for landed property, and the time for a person uh, in slavery is, is long the way it would be for landed property. But you're right. Both they, they have, in some sense, a shared root, which is a desire to clarify and re-clarify categories rather than having each person's sort of infinite total past history always be something that could reopen the question of their status. I think that's, I think it's correct. I think they respond to some kind of similar uh, intuition in, in codification because it's a, I think in some ways it's a desire to make the matter of status peremptory at a certain moment in time so that you can't go back behind it. Otherwise, in an even slightly mobile world, the question of where were you on September 1st, 1793, and the answer to that could suddenly make a difference to your status um, in a new place. I think there is a desire to codify it and get those statuses um, secured. But of course, the way it works for most of the people getting off the boat who have ever been enslaved is that they are re-enslaved. It doesn't apply to, as I understand it, I haven't dug out the Roman law, but I believe it does not apply in the same way to slaves in Roman law, but the concept of prescription does. The concept of prescription is a big concept for all kinds of property. Prescription as, a, as applied to slaves is, very, is, is specific to the Siete Partidas. I'm sure it's other places too, but it's particularly in the Siete Partidas, and that's where Chief Justice Durbigny reaches uh, to pull it out. So it's a modification. And I should add, to my surprise, in the next codification of Louisiana law in 1825, they go ahead and write it in uh, to Louisiana law, this, this concept of prescription. Now, of course, with every passing year of distance from the Haitian Revolution, it becomes harder and harder for it to be of any use to anybody, because you have to have fought your way to de facto freedom during the whole intervening period for prescription to be any good for you. It won't help if somebody re it, the, the prescription wouldn't help her little boy, because once he'd been held as a slave again by an owner, he couldn't claim to have a prescriptive right to freedom. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say that in my own work in the Andes, in the 1600s, early 1600s, I find this very same kind of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And I label it as, as a uh, ambiguity within the notarial people yeah. who didn't know or didn't want to label people certain ways. And so yeah. they would use these different terms. The same person would be called a Negro. Yeah. One set of documents, that same person would be called a mulatto. Yeah. The same person we can call the yeah. Was, I think that same kind of ambiguity that you're talking about that perhaps permeated far deeper and earlier than, than we've been thinking. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And I think that looking at the exact form of written documents is very important here, which is why I've been looking again and again at these fragmentary passenger lists that we have to try and figure out who who decides what to write down and what do they write down? So for example, in the second exodus from Santiago and Baracoa to New Orleans, very often those who are drawing up the lists describe people as criados. Now they know that the slave trade to the United States has been, foreign slave trade has been prohibited. So I think what they're doing is they're trying to hold the status of servant and those who envision themselves as owners are hoping that they can transform that 
into slave when they get off the boat. They've already been encouraged by the consul. The consul said, yes, well, it is illegal, but we hope that they'll feel sorry for you refugees and you'll, they'll allow you to bring in your slaves. So they, they, I think, quite intentionally put the word criado down there, leaving it to the next person somebody on the wharf to figure out what that means. And what the people on the wharf do is to figure out that it means slave. Now, what's interesting then is I've compared passenger lists for the big boats with many, many passengers that are going to New Orleans with the small number of little boats that are going back, that are going over to Haiti. These are often little tiny boats that have come bringing uh, firewood or whatever just across that, that little passage from Jeremy uh, over to Santiago. And no one on those boats is ever referred to as criado. Uh, so, and, and I, I actually think for those of you who've read the paper about Rosalie, I think that's what Rosalie, not Adelaide, Rosalie did, which is I think she took a small boat back to Haiti because if you were an African woman who'd survived the Middle Passage, who'd been in slavery, who had lived as free in Saint-Domingue, who had hung on to your freedom in Santiago, I think some of those people thought it's just too dangerous to go on to New Orleans. That if you managed to hold on to your freedom, there was really only one place in the Americas you could be sure of keeping it. And, and so she went back to, to IT. But that's, a, that's a different story. But I agree with you completely. The terminology is, whether we call it ambiguous or whether we call it malleable, it's intended to do lots of things at once. I think you're right. And I saw a hand there. Yeah. Right. Reverse is a specific class and pigmentocratic designation in pre Haitian revolutionary society. Uh, when the Spanish governor says gente de color, you know, is he um, referring to this legacy of the term or is it a reapplication and a malleability of the term? Well, now that's a question that I think it will take, you know, a dozen of us working for a dozen years to fully figure out because, because the term, I mean, the the term is pretty malleable itself, even already in Saint-Domingue. You know, it isn't necessarily a pigment term, although it's glossed that way in a lot of writings. And if, but you know, we mustn't be transfixed by Moreau de Saint-Méry into imagining that you know all persons array themselves in this you know Linnaean classification. I think gente de color in Spanish at this moment can refer to lots of things, but it can refer either to a subset that's designated free and distinguished from negros esclavos, or it can refer to the whole group. It really depends on the purpose at the moment. When he says, gente de color no reconociendo la esclavitud, I think he's referring to many people he perceives as black. I think that's why he is so sure that there's a mistake somewhere. They really ought to be slaves. I think that's what he's, you know, I think that, and in some cases, I think there are people who are coming in unaccompanied. And so he's caught in a bind. There's no one actually claiming them as a slave. But it doesn't feel to him as though they ought to be free. So I, I, I tend to, and this is partly because I follow Laurent's lead in this, but I tend to keep at arm's length any easy equation of imagined gradations of, of appearance and legal status. Uh, it, it, there can be, you know, th those things, as, as you know, you know, those things can cross cut. So I think gente de color in this case is being used as an overarching term that certainly includes negros. But the complicated thing is often the word negro actually means esclavo. So part of the reason he would say gente de color is that he hasn't been able to park them yet comfortably for him in the status of negros. In other correspondence, he says so-and-so arrived with 12 negros who have been given to their dueños. You know, so, it, so the terms are, are I, I, I can't find the right word, malleable, ambiguous. They're, they're usable. They're, they're, they're being used opportunistically um, and in movable ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very sympathetic to the argument, as a Brazilian, to the argument that um, you know that property rights and people, you know, is not really the essence of what slavery is. And it's kind of interesting because we were involved with a, a labor historians and historians of slavery we were involved with a project in, in, in the last decade. I mean, we'll say we resolved it because the issue is that in Brazil, one of the things that's so remarkable about Brazil, and it's true all the way till you get to the 1870s, is that the distinction of free and unfree. I mean, not talking about the property rights and humans, mm -hmm. that really, in some ways, the way I would put it is, if you can, if you have the power to command people.
people as if they are slaves, regardless of their legal status. Mm -hmm. Think about agregados. You've got free people that live dependent mm -hmm. upon you, who you can have whipped. Mm -hmm. You have slaves that you own. And in fact, the, the whole thing of the, you're still, in some ways it's interesting, and I think it's maybe because of the role of law and things like that, but this, the notion that a free status and an unfree status by law are so powerful is something that seems not to be so true. Or at least that was interesting enough to us in the Brazilian case to, you know, to uh, mm -hmm. you know, spend a couple of years trying to figure out, you know, figure this question out. Uh, it's well, one of the reasons why, for example, in, it's not been possible since 1595 to enslave Indians, and yet, as Linda Lewin showed, Indians are being enslaved. And if you can hold Indians as slaves, if enslaved in the 1840s and in the 1740s and in the 1640s, if you can hold the people as slaves, that's what it is. And, and in some ways, one of the uh, uh, 20th century legal scholar writing about this, and this also goes back to Nabucco's thing, which is that slavery is about the power to command. It's about domination. It's not actually about it. If you can command it, then it's not so much even what the paperwork says, in a way. So it's a kind of an interesting question of whether or not, in other words, whether or not the status of, of what we would think of as the unfreedom, whether those legal distinctions are as important, you know, as they, as 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 we tend to think they do in a certain type of law governed understanding of what a relationship of domination is. Well. I'm going to agree and disagree, both, OK? Um, I, I completely agree with your point about domination. And one can't really work on 21st century slavery without agreeing with some substantial element of that. Otherwise, if we were to be legal formalists about it, we would just say that there wasn't such a thing anymore. It's been abolished. So I, I agree with that. But I would say that much of the kind of argument that I'm making has been stimulated by work of Sidney Shalhoub, Kayla Grinberg, and Sylvia Lara on Brazil on illegal enslavement. So what I think is important is to both somehow hold in our minds at the same time an awareness that domination is a core defining feature of slavery. But I wouldn't go to the point of saying, therefore, the distinction between free and unfree is not as significant as we think it is. It sure mattered for Adelaide's little boy. I mean, it made all the difference in the world. So I think we need to find a way to hold uh, both concepts in motion so that we're not, we're not uh, imagining that somehow there's this you know, rule of law and that law is all powerful and that there's a fact of the matter about every individual that needs to be uncovered legally, but that we do hold on to an awareness that the distinction between a legally ratified power of domination and a power of domination not legally ratified could, under certain circumstances, become absolutely crucial even though I would agree with you completely that one can be held and, and one can be held under conditions indistinguishable from slavery in a morning till night sense. I, I agree with that. But I wouldn't take it to the point of saying the distinction is not as important as we think it is. The distinction can be pretty important even while there are multiple forms of control. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm yeah. agreeing with that, but what I'm saying is it's got to do with, the, in, in some ways, it has to, all, all I'm saying is it has to do with the, the relationship. I mean, the way in which one of the, the one way of describing it is that in some ways the law gives over a set of people to command, and the law mm -hmm. stops at the owner. And then if the owner can, you know what I mean? The, the question of whether or not the law interferes within the context of the relationship. In the, I mean, it's sort of the question of how you structure, how you structure the legal authorities or what's recognized. And that's yeah. kind of an interesting question that produces all sorts of. I mean, I. And unfortunately, we don't really know enough about, I mean, there's been lots of other additional good work on a lot of these laws. And it, only, it really matters, as you say, in the second half of the 19th century, when after the Civil War and when the slave, anti-slavery movement begins to get going and begin, legal professionals begin to get involved, that mm -hmm. these issues become more prominent. And that's some of the studies mm -hmm. we've got. But, you know, I mean, it's interesting, though, that the, the dichotomy of being free and unfree and the advantages and disadvantages, I, I'm not saying that they don't matter, and I'm not yeah. saying they don't matter to the people themselves, but on the other hand, they are, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a murkier boundary in the Brazilian case, and it sort of it gives us space for thinking about things that yeah. 
But it would be, it would be I, Haiti, it would be, that's where freedom has come, so that it's come in the most radical way. So I would, of course, expect the world that's reverberating, that part of the world is reverberating with these questions. Yeah. From the time you're studying for this to be the vital issue. Yeah. It's better if the domination has to pass through law. If it doesn't, because yeah. if it doesn't, then it, you know, you're in real trouble. Of course. I'm not sure how much time we have. I, I, is there someone keeping? Is there someone keeping time? Because I we have five, more minutes. five more minutes. Okay, Law Hall. Yeah, just to, I mean, I do think that within Haiti, it's actually very interesting, especially when you get to Santo Domingo. Where yep. I mean, there are the same kinds of murky stuff happens even after emancipation, yep. and then. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to ask was well, two things. One was was. Want to speak up a little so people in the yeah, back can hear you? Um, I wanted to ask two things. One was with the phrase of those who do not, you know, they do not mm -hmm. recognize slavery. I'm just wondering your thoughts about whether you think that was uttered to this man. In other words, is that something that the people coming from Haiti expressed, oh. or is that his own kind of summary of something? Right. Just to, I know if, I don't know if you have any way to answer that. I'm just curious what you think about that. Wouldn't I, I love to know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean. But, I mean. I, I, I don't. I, mean, I I just don't know. It's the phrase that the governor uses, gente de color no reconociendo la esclavitud. Right? Like right. Now, you know, I've often said, again, speculatively, that it was presumably very dangerous to get off a boat from Haiti and say, I am free because of the action of Toussaint Louverture. Yeah. I do not recognize slavery. <laughs> now, presumably, no that no was, trouble here. Yeah. Yeah, presumably that was a good way to get Right. Uh, in really deep trouble. <laughs> uh, so I'm assuming that recognition here may mean something other than you know, verbalized right. uh, defiance. The document that I recently found, and which I need to sort of pour over, there is a list from July of 1803 of everyone who's found lodgings in the houses of uh, fam families in Santiago. There's anyone who's taken Santo Domingo refugees into their house is supposed to file with the governor uh, a list of who they are. And you know, you get ones where it'll say, well, there's Madame so and so and Monsieur so and so, and then there's, then there's, uh, you know, Hélène, whom they say is their slave, right? So, you know, ca can we pull out from some of these documents some sense of what's happening? I think in some cases, the question, this may get back to your point, the question of free or slave status actually wasn't absolutely determined at the moment of getting off the boat. Right. You know, people had gone through the process of flight and of, of crossing the passage together. They may have moved into a household together. But it's not hard to imagine that in some cases, the the former owners were imagining that they were now going to be able to rebuild the relation of ownership. And the person who was a former slave was now imagining that that relation would never be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And that for the moment, that person may still be taking care of the babies or doing whatever the task is, having absolutely no resources and needing to sleep and eat. And I suspect if we were able to find the right vein of notarial and legal records in the Santiago archives, and Lou knows how hard it is to get in and use the Santiago archives. But if we were able to find those, I suspect we would uncover cases and testimony that would give us little glimpses of that, where someone would say, well, of course I lived with them for the first year because I'd always cared for their children. Yes, they gave me food to eat, but I never, I never recognize them as my master. I'm just making this up. I'm inventing a document. But you know, a lot of documents, you, you, dream, them up, you dream them up first, and then you go find them. I'm, I, it's not, probably not a recognized method, but, but the, manumission do, the manumission document for Rosalie of the Poulard Nation, I dreamed it first. And I flew to France, and by God, it was there. And uh, so we can dream this up. If anybody's going to go to Santiago, I'm looking at anybody who's doing research on Cuba, uh, check out the notarial records and probably the very local court records. These are things that really show up in the equivalent of uh, in Louisiana's parish courts. It's a pure fluke that Adelaide's ever made it to the Supreme Court to get indexed as having to do with Santo Domingo, as they called it. San Domingue, in order for us to then be able to climb, it was then able to climb back down and dig out the lower court records and get all the testimony. But I hope somebody can start doing that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, please. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.